We have a, a nurse practitioner uh, whose bi biography scared me to death. I, I thought he was uh, just a nurse. He's a nurse practitioner. Most people call him doctor. He is extremely well qualified, and we are proud to have him as part of our, our group. Uh, Johns Hopkins and all other medical training, I will let you listen to Dr. Lee Porter. I'm Lee Porter, I'm a nurse practitioner, clinical nurse specialist. I, I have a practice in Wilmington, North Carolina. It's a neuropsychiatry practice. I own the practice and I'm also a clinician there. The practice specializes in the treatment of stress-related disorders, neuroendocrine disorders, um, various anxiety disorders, PTSD, things like that. Um, so it's a neuro neuropsychiatry practice with a special uh, subspecialty that's sort of an integrated medicine practice as well. Um, my background is, is rather um, varied. Um, I came to North Carolina approximately 12 years ago. I think actually tomorrow's my 14th will be my 13th anniversary here. Um, when I first came here, I worked at the Southeastern Center, which is a community mental health center that uh, serves the Tri-County area. Um, I also worked in their substance abuse center, their detox center, and their outpatient substance abuse center. Um, so I have a lot of experience in the area that's a crossover of the field. Um, prior to coming to North Carolina, I worked in a variety of um, settings. Um, I started my career out at NIH, um, where I did work with the um, groundbreaking research on the atypical psych psychotics. I did clinical support care there for that program. And I also worked at the FDA, the Center for Biologics, which is the branch of the FDA that um, is responsible for um, the type of compounds that cannabis is, the botanicals, and I worked at the, uh, Center for the, for, the Center for Biologics. In addition to uh, my background, um, my um, background as a nurse um, gives me a, a, provides me a different perspective, I think, than, than the traditional medical approach. Um, nurses um, look as part of their theoretical framework, the, the biopsychosocial approach. And as you probably all know from uh, listening to uh, people talk about the field, that cannabis involves really this, all these three spheres. The, the biological or the human organism with the endocannabinoid system, the psychological world, and, and that involves also the stigma that cannabis users deal with and also some of the psychological um, issues that, they, that, that users deal with, and also the social sphere, the, the legal side primarily, and the, the impacts of uh, cannabis on the, uh, the social uh, society at large. In addition to that, some of the core roles of nurses are um, in the area of patient advocacy. What we do is we do those core functions, preserving patient health and dignity. We provide patient education. We implement care, and we assess patient health risk. And all those things are important if we implement a medical cannabis plan. And I think it's important that we have nurses involved in the process to provide good education, provide better access to care, and provide more comprehensive care. Anyway, without further ado, the main messages of my, my talk are um, these three things. Um, that the evidence for medicinal value of cannabis is very strong. The literature is extensive. As of 2007, there were over 2,700 publications um, that were put out, and every year it's growing exponentially. Um, cannabis has an excellent safety profile. And thirdly, the legal consequences are more harmful to users, and I argue, and society, than the actual cannabis use. I can see like minds think alike here. Um, as, as Dr. Bago um, brought up, not all of it is about the psychoactive compound THC. A lot of it is about the CBD that he covered up at the top. There's extensive research in this area. And as you can see around the sphere, there's different 
disorders and different symptoms that respond to the different compounds, the constituent compounds that are in cannabis. Again, Dr. Baker went over this, I won't spend too much time, but it again reinforces the safety of cannabis. Um, quite frankly, it uh, doesn't even pass a laugh test, it would probably be available over the counter if we didn't have to deal with some of the stigma. Um, secondly, the consequences of arrest. Enforcement, not use, disproportionately nets the most vulnerable populations. I've seen this in my work all the time, particularly at Southeastern Center's uh, Substance Abuse Center. I work with the jail. You see the same vulnerable populations in the jail. I worked at New Hanover County Jail as a consultant for a while. It targets um, racial minorities. We have a mass incarceration problem in this country relative to the, um, the black community. It affects them disproportionately. It hits them hard. Um, the mentally ill. Veterans have been caught up in this loop, but now increasingly the elderly as the population ages. I won't get into the weeds here with this slide, but as you can see down here at the bottom, there's about 27,000 arrests in North Carolina, and 91% of them are for simple marijuana possession. That means to go after the 8 or 9% of the kingpins or dealers that they're looking for, they have to harm a lot of people. So the take home message here is people are using this regardless of the law. The use hasn't changed and the current policy is not a deterrent. We're just incarcerating the vulnerable. The health consequences of, on the biological and psychological side of an arrest are quite severe. I can tell you way more severe than any harm that a lifetime of marijuana smoke every day will cause you. These are just some of the things. Now the Holmes and Ray uh, scale is a scale that's commonly used in the field of psychology to assess stress and the effects of stress. I won't read these, but you can see that they're, they're fairly severe. So the question that a lot of people ask, can a plant be a medicine? It doesn't fit the current or the prevailing pharmacological paradigm. But a plant can be a medicine, it's a botanical medicine. And as you can see on the other side, there's pharmaceutical drugs. 4,000 years old. A lot of clinical, uh, empirical uh, evidence. The other thing is that there's many, many ingredients in botanical cannabis. And this is a kicker. With a whole product, there's synergistic action. As we're moving to whole foods, that's the same paradigm. That there are, there are constituent compounds in these, com these more larger compounds that act together to give the total effect. Whereas on pharmaceutical drugs, there's a narrow margin of safety. As Dr. Baker was showing you with that chart that showed the relative uh, lethality of the different substances. So what's the difference about cannabis? Why is this such a big deal? What's, what's, the, um, what's the issue here? Well, there's a, in um, 1990 at NIMH, they discovered the endogenous cannabinoid system. We have a naturally occurring system in our nervous systems, which we share with all animals greater than mollusks or hydras. That includes humans. Then in 1992, Raphael Machulam and his group in Israel discovered the, the naturally occurring endogenous endocannabinoids that Dr. Vega mentioned, an endomine and 2-AG. There's probably some more we haven't discovered yet. And as Dr. Baker was saying, this plays an important auto-regulatory function. It modulates synaptic traffic in the, at the neuronal junctions. And the, and the, the um, net effect is that it maintains the homeostasis of the neuroendocrine system. It has an auto-regulatory function for the entire system. 
Now, Mother Nature didn't give us the endocannabinoid system by accident. It's there for a reason. These are some of the biological roles for the endocannabinoid system. And number one is very important, energy metabolism. There's probably more. So there's um, a, a lot of um, research now and interest in the CBTs, not just THC. As you probably all know, THC is the psychoactive compound in cannabis. However, CBD is not psychoactive. It has, there may be some um, mild psychoactive uh, properties to it, but it's not particularly psychoactive. But CBC competes with THC at receptor and elimination sites, so that's some of the pharmacology there. Um, but CBD, which is cannabidiol, has greater affinity for CB2 receptor sites, which are in the periphery. They're outside of the central nervous system, so they're outside of the brain. And cannabis strains that are relatively higher in CBD versus THC ratio are um, typically produce less intoxication, and those are the um, types of uh, strains that were commonly referred to as cannabis indica strains, and these strains are widely used for medicinal purposes. They're not as um, psychoactive as the cannabis sativa strains. Frequently people will use cannabis sativa strains if they know how to use them correctly during the day. And as I mentioned, the pharmaceutical research is really intensifying over the last couple of years uh, with research into the CBD subsystem. Here's, some, um, uh, here's a slide that shows the incidence of dependence in cannabis use that underscores that cannabis is not a particularly addictive, dr addictive drug. Uh, there, there's a distinction between addiction and habituation. And Actually, in the DSM, the Bible of Psychiatry Diagnosis, there isn't even a um, diagnosis for cannabis addiction. It doesn't exist. Um, furthermore, um, uh, there's other substances that you can be addicted to and not be breaking the law. There's plenty of alcoholics that are alcoholic and addicted to alcohol that are not in jail. So there's addiction is a psychological or behavioral term that is used to describe dysfunctional behaviors surrounding the obtaining of a substance. Um, it's different from habituation and tolerance. People who smoke cannabis regularly, use cannabis for medical reasons, will sometimes develop habituation, dependence, and tolerance. But that is not the same thing as addiction. I could tell, talk more about that if anybody's interested, but I think you could make that distinction with some of the legislators. And so um, this basically shows that when people get exposed to a substance, how many go on to become dependent on it? And as you can see, cannabis is down there with caffeine below alcohol and all the other um, legal substances besides heroin and cocaine. Um, another thing you'll hear is that um, smoking marijuana must be deleterious to your health because you're breathing in um, toxic chemicals from the smoke vapor. But actually, um, smoking may be one of the safest ways to administer the drug. Um, people can actually titrate the dose very specifically when they smoke it or inhale it through a vaporizer. And with the new potency strains, the higher potency strains, sometimes a puff or two is enough to get somebody through the day or through a couple of hours. If you couple that with the various water pipes and things like that, you're not actually inhaling that much vapor per day relative to the benefits of the drug. Tinctures and edible cannabis preparations are actually more susceptible to adverse effects because dosing is less predictable. However, that probably can be fixed in the future with standardizations. They standardize botanical compounds all the time at the FDA. So if we can get this legal, we can probably fix that problem. We can get the various edibles standardized. The topical preparations that are currently available in the legal states are quite safe. They could, like I said earlier, they could probably be used over the counter. And 
from a real abuse point of view, cannabis is not particularly, or any of the extracts or the oils, is not particularly suitable for IV injection to really ramp up the potency and the toxicity because it's a lipid-based substance and it does not dissolve in water, and so the, it's a very difficult IV preparation to make. And the average person would not want to tackle that for the benefit ratio. So it, it's not really a, a drug that can be used for uh, abuse. And as, as we saw earlier, you probably need to smoke uh, two or three kilos of marijuana in about an hour or two to put you out. Most people would find that unpleasant. So it's a self-limiting, uh, self-governing uh, drug in many ways. It's, and because of the way it's processed in the liver, and it's uh, lipid filling, and as you all probably know, has a long half-life, much the bane to drug testing, it is, it's even safer because there's no acute withdrawal. It has such a long uh, elimination period out of the tissues. It pretty much gets stored in the adipose or the fat tissue. So that brings me to another point, is that positive drug testing has nothing to do with intoxication. The actual intoxicating effects of marijuana are gone in a matter of an hour or two after a, a standard intoxicating dose and dissipate down to nearly undetectable levels after four or five hours. That's true of anybody, even if you're having a panic attack for the first time and never smoked the uh, highly activating cannabis sativa. <laughs> so usually when they bring these people into the ER, they do nothing. They just reassure them, and it goes away on its own. And there is no diagnosis in the DSM of the Bible of Psychiatry for Cannabis Addiction. In 2008, a meta-analysis at McGill University, which is a very prestigious university in Canada, and the University of British Columbia, reviewed 23 clinical investigations and eight observational studies over four decades, from the period of 66 to 2007 and found no higher incidence of adverse effects for the cannabis users versus the normal controls. So when you hear people say we need more research, I think you should counter them by saying the research is there, they need to search PubMed, and they need to look at history, because cannabis has been around for approximately 7,000 years with a 4,000 history of medical use, in approximately 2,000 years of use in the Western world. It was used in Greece and the Roman Empire after it migrated from Asia Minor and China. So I think, what do you think, time for a paradigm shift? Yeah. I think the legislators are really serious about regulatory reform, like they said. It's time to get serious, do something about the prescription drug abuse problem, and legalize medical cannabis. Yes, sir. I just want to say a few things about some of the books that I've been reading. That I, I've read a ton of books in the last couple of years, but some that really stand out in my mind, and that I base some of my work of presenting this presentation on. Um, this is the science of marijuana. This was written by Leslie Iverson. He's a pharmacologist at Oxford University. This is a great book. If you can get any of the legislators to read that, that would be wonderful. It goes into the subject in great detail, and when you get done with it, you pretty much realize from a clinical pharmacology point of view, it's ridiculous that this substance is where it is right now in the United States. Irv Rosenfeld, he was one of the original um, Federal Government Compassionate Use Patients. That's Irv's story in a nutshell. It's a quick read. It's a wonderful book. Irv has a um, genetic disorder, um, where, and I forget the name, it's a complicated name, but it's a, uh, it affects the cartilage of the bones, and it makes tumors grow on his bones. He's had this since childhood. He's now um, in his 50s, and he's a stockbroker in, in Florida, and he credits marijuana for saving his life. 
He doesn't touch the uh, illegal marijuana. He told me at a conference he only uses the government marijuana. By the way, how many people know that the government actually has the patent on THC? If so, if they don't think it has any medical value, why do they have the patent? And the patent says it has neuroprotective properties. It's CBD, actually. And CBD, it's THC and, and, and CBD. And they sold it to Unimed, one of the pharmaceutical companies. No, no, we're talking about just the, just the patent for the endocannabinoids, not an actual medication. You're, you're referring to Baranol. Baranol is a synthetic yeah, preparation. THC. Yeah, Mar just a word on Marinol. Marinol is a synthetic THC product. It's not a whole plant product. No. It's, it's, it's just basically THC in a liquid. And the clinical problem with Marinol it has a long onset of action, and um, you know it's THC primarily. It's not CBD, and it can be quite activating for people who are ill with you know, debilitating conditions and things like that. So a lot of pe people cannot tolerate it very well. It's synthetic. That's and, it's, and it's also synthetic. It and a lot of people say it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. But it does underscore the government's present hypocritical stance towards cannabis not having medical value if they actually own the patents and they actually have approved cannabis-based products. They for a new patent to, to combine psychotropic drugs with cannabis. I'll get some questions in a little bit. I just want to be respectful of time. The other book is by Christopher Fitchner. He's a physician. And that goes into the, the economics of the current system. And as you probably all know, there's a huge vested interest uh, from an economic point of view of maintaining the current system with the um, private industrial prison complex that we've had, uh, various things like that. So that's going to be a tough one to dismantle. And the New Jim Crow, the great Bible, it talks about the mass incarceration of the drug, of the drug war victims. And that this is a major societal problem. I really recommend everyone to get familiar with that book and to make legislators aware of this problem. This needs to be changed. Thank you.